Thank you, Rachel, and thank all of you for coming out this afternoon. Uh, I'm not a college professor, but I do play one on TV. Uh, I played one on TV earlier this afternoon, in fact, so uh, I'm in the swing of that right now. And in my professorial uh, guise here, I want to start off by <laughs> referring to some books. I don't know if anybody reads books anymore, but... Uh, in case you're one of the remnant who's still willing to read a book, I want to make reference to uh, two or three things here. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about uh, the question of is government the problem uh, it, with regard mainly to the government's uh, role in uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s and and uh, with some reference to the recent uh, recession, which uh, is still in progress in many respects. Uh, but uh, I want to say, because I know already I'm not going to be able to cover much ground in the time available to me this afternoon, that if you would like to uh, read a more systematic presentation of what I'm going to bumble around with in the next 35 or 40 minutes, uh, you can go to my book called Neither Liberty Nor Safety, and in that book uh, you will find uh, chapter 5, which is called uh, What Got Us Into and Out of the Great Depression. So uh, that is, uh, in a way, a, a, a documented and uh, more articulate version of what uh, I'm going to talk about for the most part right now. Now, in that same regard, uh, the Great Depression is uh, not only one of the <laughs> foremost crises of American economic and social and political life um, in the last two centuries, but also a, a, a topic of a tremendous interest to economists from the time it took place to the present. And uh, I have no idea how many thousands of articles have been written about the Depression and hundreds, maybe even thousands of books. But uh, an odd thing about all this scholarship is that the best book I have ever seen on the Great Depression was one published in 1937 and virtually forgotten. Uh, if I went to the American Economic Association meetings and collared economists as they came out the door and said, what do you know about a book by Phillips McManus and Nelson? I dare say not one economist in a hundred would have any idea. They'd never heard of this book. Uh, but there is a book called Banking and the Business Cycle, uh, which is subtitled A Study of the Great Depression in the United States uh, by these three authors, Phillips, McManus, and Nelson. Uh, you can uh, get this book free uh, on the Mises Institute uh, website. Uh, or they will sell it to you at a very reasonable price if you want a, a hard copy. But uh, highly recommended. It's the best thing, I believe, ever written on this subject. And today, it's just a shame that economists haven't read this book. They would be so much more knowledgeable if they had. Uh, I'll probably quote a few things from it later on. Uh, so uh, please bear those in mind. Now. Before I start talking about the Great Depression or the current recession, I want to just start off by, by reviewing some of the basics about a market economy. And these are all uh, things that you learned when you took your first course in economics, I hope. I hope it was a course in microeconomics, uh, not macro. Uh, best not even say anything about macro, uh, except I recommend Phillips and McManus and Nelson. <laughs> but uh, when you learn about microeconomics, you learn about individuals and uh, firms and uh, industries and how they interact in the course of, of economic competition and cooperation. And uh, if you had a good professor when you took your basic economics course, he explained to you that the economy consists of a vast system of, of economic cooperation. That's the most important thing to understand. Uh, it's not a system of dog-eat-dog. -dog. It's a system in which 
All the actions are voluntary. What is not voluntary is not part of the market system as such. It's something loaded onto the market system as such. But if you start with basics, which is uh, private property rights over the means of production, and that includes ourselves. We own ourselves and the services we're capable of providing. Uh, people own land, they own material capital, such as machinery and factory buildings and the like. And if private property owners hold rights to use these various forms of property, they find it in their interest to trade with one another, to exchange rights in such a way that they become better off. So that the upshot of this is a, an enormous, intricate arrangement of deals of voluntary transactions people make with one another, each party making a deal voluntarily in the expectation of making himself better off in his own judgment. Okay? And it's just not to say people won't mis make mistakes, they won't regret their choices later on sometimes, but it's just to say that all the deals are voluntary, that what's going on here is a system of cooperation. Now, very often you're told that it's a system of competition. And in a sense, it's that too. Uh, because, uh, in, a, in a sense, the, the producers of a particular good compete with one another for the business of consumers. In a way, workers compete with one another uh, for the best deal they can make with employers and so forth. So that there is competition involved in the operation of the system but the important thing is to understand that it's a system of voluntary deals, highly intricately interrelated amongst one another, and that the outcome of it is not chaos. The outcome of all of these freely made uh, decentralized decisions is in fact orderly and in many ways understandable and even predictable within limits. And this is the kind of order that we call a spontaneous order because it's not an order that was derived by anyone in charge of the system because no one is in charge of the system. Everyone who holds a private property right is in charge of part of the system, his part. Okay? So the order that emerges is an unplanned order. It's an order that is the product, as uh, it was said in the 18th century, of human action but not of human intention or design. No one decided they want the economy to look like such and such at the end of 2013. It just came out that way as a result of a lot of people's interactions. Now of course we don't have in the world in which we live, and in fact there never was at any time, a pure market system, a system in which all that happened was a lot of people with private property rights interacting and making deals with one another. We've always had various forms of involvement by the political authorities, uh, even from long ago times when we had the Lord of the Manor getting involved in the economic life of the peasantry or the merchants. Nowadays, of course, we have governments at many different levels all deeply involved in interfering with and acting within the context of the market activity that goes on in the world. Taxing some things, subsidizing other things, regulating almost all things in one way or another. So that governments are deeply uh, involved in economic life now to a much greater extent than they were uh, previously, especially before the last few decades. But nonetheless, uh, what we have there is then a, a, a kind of social situation in which things may happen because that was the product of the spontaneous order, or they may happen because of the way the government intervened in the spontaneous order, changed it, distorted its outcomes, altered its normal operation. Okay? Now, many people like to believe that all these government interventions are for a good purpose. They believe, and in this country, the dominant ideologies for the past hundred years or so has been progressivism, which is to say 
the belief that above all, government can and should intervene in economic life quite actively uh, and that that will all be for the good. And today, of course, there are many progressives in the American population and they are working hard to have government do more uh, than it's doing already. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is just an element of life as it's developed, but it's had consequences. And so what I want to talk about is some of the particular kinds of consequences that this government intervention uh, has had, uh, particularly in the greatest seeming failures of the market system. And I stress seeming failures because indeed uh, these great disasters such as the Great Depression of the 1930s were by no means simply a product of the spontaneous market order. Nothing of the sort, in fact. Now, I, I had some displays, but it appears that the technology is going to let me down here, so I'm going to have to wing it with you. And that's too bad because one picture is worth a thousand words, and I had six or seven pictures, so you're going to have to sit here longer than you thought. <laughs> but, uh, but at all events, let me start off by saying a little bit about the, the lead up to the Great Depression of the 1930s. One way to think about the Depression is to say everything was hunky dory in the 1920s and then capitalism went to hell. Things just went wrong and they went wrong because of uh, capitalist acts among consenting adults, <laughs> to borrow that expression. Uh, people made uh, terribly mistaken arrangements in economic life and as a result they made a mess of things when and it all came down like a house of cards from the middle of 1929 onward. But, uh, uh, but that isn't why it happened. In fact, uh, the most important thing to understand about the, the Great Depression is that the seeds of it lie actually back in World War I when governments of all the advanced countries set aside the market system more or less completely in, in, all over the, the uh, countries of, of Europe and uh, the European offshoots in the United States, Canada, and elsewhere. And the governments took over control to some extent of economic life in order to facilitate their prosecution of the war. Uh, this happened more completely in Germany uh, than it did in the United States but it happened more or less along those German lines everywhere, in France, in Great Britain, in the United States, and Italy. And uh, so this was actually the beginning of the end of the old regime of the 19th century, a regime where we had the gold standard as a monetary system, a regime of fairly reliable and strong private property rights, a regime of limited government, and a regime, not by accident, of rapid economic progress. The economic progress of the 19th century was so mind-boggling that many people at the time could hardly grasp it. Uh, the difference between how the masses of people lived in 1800 and how they lived in 1900 was truly astonishing. We like to think nowadays that progress is speeded up and it's faster than ever. I'm not so sure of that, actually. If you go back and compare how people actually lived, you can make a very good argument that the century before 1914 was even more impressive than the century since 1914. But however that may be, that old system was torn to shreds by the operations of governments during World War I. And after the war, they set about trying to put the pieces of Humpty back together again, but he wouldn't be put back here or in the story. Okay? You can't put uh, these broken eggs back together once you smash them. But the governments tried very hard to do that, and some of the actions they took in the process of doing that during the 1920s uh, led directly to the breakdown of 1929 and the onset of the Great Depression. The most important thing was monetary actions taken by the Federal Reserve System, which was an institution created in the United States at the end of 1913 
It was the first time we had a true central bank in the United States. We had some sort of elementary uh, prototypes, as it were, earlier in our history, but for a long time we hadn't had anything even verging on a central bank. And then in 1913, the, the Congress and the President created this system and, uh, as it were, expected it to do some things to keep banks out of trouble during financial panics and thereby to benefit the general public. Uh, so this was the idea, and people thought sometimes that it would eliminate the business cycle, that the Fed would be able to manage money in such a way that we'd no longer have de periodic depressions and financial panics. Well, that wasn't going to be so, but at all events, that was the, the vision that people had in the beginning. Now, what happened in the 1920s is that the Fed, uh, in cooperation with the Bank of England, took actions to help the English return to convertibility of the pound sterling against gold. They suspended that convertibility during the war in order to print a lot of pounds sterling and pay for the war. Uh, and in the process, they had driven up the price level in Great Britain by about 100% or more. Okay? So prices more or less double in Great Britain between 1915 and 1920. They also about doubled in the United States during that same period uh, because the, in this country, the Federal Reserve System was doing just what the Bank of England was doing over there. Uh, but the consequences were worse for the English because they wanted to revert to convertibility and uh, the fact is they just weren't in an economic position to do that at the old exchange rate. Nonetheless, in 1925, they tried to do it. And in order to help them, the Federal Reserve System in this country, in several different years, in 1922, 24, and 27 especially, made credit very easy here. Made it easy for banks to borrow from the Federal Reserve and therefore to have the, the funds that they could relend or invest. So easy money in this country in the 1920s was designed to hold down interest rates here. Uh, now remember, interest rate is a price. And in fact, it's probably the most important of all prices in the market system because it's the rate of exchange between any good now and goods in the future. Okay? That's basically what it is. No luck? Okay. Now, Notice here what I'm saying. I'm saying the Fed was taking a policy action that distorted market prices, the most important market price of all, the rate of interest. When the government intervenes in the economy and distorts market prices, what it's doing is distorting the signals that private parties use to decide what deals serve their interests best in the market. If I'm a producer and I want to say, would it pay me to sell this gizmo? I want to know what it would cost me to make it and market it, how much I would get for it when I sold it. I estimate that in terms of market prices, prices I have to pay for resources, prices I'll get from consumers when I sell the final product. Prices are the essence of the information that holds together the spontaneous order. If you distort those signals, what you're doing is spreading lies. You're spreading lies to decision makers about how they can best serve their interests in the market. And people will react to those lies. All they do is look at prices. They don't know on the face of it whether this is, as it were, a true market price or a distorted market price. They have no way to know that. Okay? Even if you know the government is intervening, you don't know quite how much of an effect it's having. All you know is that interest rates wouldn't be this low if the Fed weren't taking these actions, but you don't know how much lower they've been made. So you're still likely reacting to some very false information. Okay? So the Fed was falsifying people's information about the rate of interest and causing them to make mistakes. And the kind of mistakes that are most likely to be made in this situation is that investors will see long-term projects as more profitable than they actually are. Okay? There's an arithmetic you can use. You don't need any economic theory to show this. All you need is 
the knowledge of how to compute the present value of a future stream of income. And you've probably all learned that at some point in economics or finance. If you don't, do it today. It's one of the most important things anyone can know. Present values of future values. Okay? And you do this with using the interest rate to discount future values back to present equivalents. Okay? So if you suppress the interest rate, you have a bigger effect on long-term, long-lived income streams than you have on short-term soon terminated income streams. And what you do then is you make long-term projects look more profitable than they really are. And that happens usually in the form of construction booms, real estate development booms, booms in the stock market. And that's exactly what happened in the United States in the 1920s as a result of the Fed's distortion of the interest rates here. The Fed wasn't even thinking about this. See, they were thinking about helping the British. Hold down interest rates here, funds are less likely to flow out of Britain, and therefore Britain has a better chance to resume conversion of the pound sterling at the old exchange rate of currency against gold. But you never do just one thing in social life. Okay? You always do lots of things when you take one action, and that's what the Fed did here. So we had all these uh, uh, booms, bubbles, in fact, in the Florida real estate and commercial office buildings in Chicago and New York, especially uh, in residential real estate development all over the country. And uh, if you've been paying attention in the last uh, six or seven years, you'll see that very similar things happened in this country then. Easy credit engineered by the Fed between 2002 and 2005, set in motion a housing uh, boom and a bubble uh, and a, a boom in all kinds of mortgage-related securities, derivatives of mortgage notes, and uh, a boom in the stock market all tumbling down uh, in 2008 uh, very quickly in the early part of 2009. So, so there are many parallels between what was done in the 1920s and early 30s and what was done in the past several years in this country. And again, the, it's not the market system that's failing here, let me reiterate. It's the monetary authorities' interference in the market system that's bringing about this trouble. Okay? Now, when the bust took place in the, starting in the middle of 1929, it, it, it gained momentum very quickly, and uh, even though there were a few erratic turnarounds, uh, it continued for almost four years. And by the time it hit bottom in the early part of 1933, the real GDP of the United States had fallen by about 30 okay? percent. That took you down to an income level comparable to what the United States had in the early 1890s. To give you, it's as if 40 years of economic progress had just been wiped away and people were back to the level of living of their grandfathers. Okay? Uh, so, this was a devastating event for many people. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of unemployment at the bottom. Nearly 25% of the labor force was unemployed, and of the three quarters of the labor force working, about a third of them were working part-time when they wanted full-time work. So partly or fully, half of the entire American labor force was unemployed or underemployed in early 1933. Think of that. If we had that today, if we had that today, how many people would be underemployed or unemployed? Well, say six, 60 million, <laughs> to put it in perspective. It's unimaginable, and it was pretty much unimaginable when it happened here. Nothing on that scale ever happened before. Not, nothing, thank God, has ever happened on that scale since. To give you a comparison, a real GDP in the current recession fell by about 5%. It all took place in about, in, in, in about a year and a half from the beginning of 2008 to the middle of 2009. 
And then re recovery started, although it was slow recovery and it's still incomplete, particularly in the labor market. But that was, uh, that was the scope of the thing. And indeed, uh, when, just when the Great Depression seemed to have finally ended around 1941, uh, it really didn't because that was the very time when the government was beginning to divert resources, including labor, which it was drafting by the millions, uh, into war purposes. And during the war, even though you had very high levels of GDP, they didn't mean anything for the people's uh, prosperity because more than half of, of all that gain was going to guns and ammunition. So if you look at the private part of the GDP, what you find is that after 1941, it actually fell substantially. And it didn't fully recover until 1946 when the war was over. So you've got what I think was a, was a depression that actually lasted not 12 years, but more, more like 18 years it, it's, uh, or close to it, all the way from 1929 to 1946. And, uh, and it's two different kinds of depression, but it's still depression. It's not true prosperity at any point in that long span. But what it is in that long span is a lot of government interference, and even more during the war than during the Depression. So uh, one effect of it was that the American people got used to being ordered around and accepted it to a large extent, uh, being told by the government what they could do in economic life, what they couldn't do, what they must do, and so forth. So, what did the government do? Well, when the Depression really got started, uh, Herbert Hoover, who, who, who is often called the do-nothing president, uh, uh, supposedly did nothing. Well, this is the, one of the biggest myths in American history. If your school teachers told, told you this when you took history class, you should sue them. <laughs> All right? This is not just a regular mistake that any teacher might make. This is a horrible mistake. Herbert Hoover was a progressive. He was not a conservative. He never called himself a conservative. He considered himself a progressive his entire life. And when he was an old man, he wrote a laudatory book about Woodrow Wilson. What more can the man do? OK, well, what more he could do was what he did between 1929 and 1933 when he left office. He took a number of unprecedented actions to intervene in economic life in ways that he thought would alleviate the Depression and end it sooner. Okay? Now, think about this. Herbert Hoover was not a dummy like our presidents these days. Okay? Herbert Hoover was a very accomplished man. He, he was a smart guy. He had been a very successful businessman and engineer. He'd worked all over the world. He'd made tons of money. He was a smart guy. But you see, the government is nowadays full of smart guys, isn't it? They come in there with degrees from Yale and Princeton and Harvard, dime a dozen. Smart guys. There's a difference between being smart and knowing what the hell you are doing. Okay? <laughs> Hoover was a smart guy, but when it came to the economy, he did not know what the hell he was doing. And so he took a number of actions that made the Depression much worse than it would have been if he had been the do-nothing president the historians say he was. The first thing he did, and one of the worst things, in the fall of 1929, is he called in a lot of the big employers uh, in the country, and he had a series of conferences. And then he sent some people around to get more employers to sign on to a plan. And his plan was, don't reduce wage rates. Uh, we've given up, finally. <laughs> uh, all hope is lost. Uh, you're stuck with me. Uh, don't, don't, don't lower wage rates. He, Hoover had talked himself into the idea, he and some others, that what was important in maintaining prosperity was that workers' purchasing power be maintained. 
Now, in the past, whenever there was a recession, employers had tended to cut wage rates because when their sales fell off, you know, if they continue to pay people the same wages, they're going to lose more money than they were already. So one of the ways they adjusted, okay, part of the spontaneous order was to adjust the terms of wage agreements. It had always been done before. Wages tended to be cut, not necessarily slashed to the bone, but you know, maybe an employer cut wages 10% to start with. 15, 20, almost never more than that. But by cutting wages, employers were able to keep their costs from rising so much relative to their revenues when their revenues were falling because of a, a declining economic activity, because of recession. Okay? Now, a bunch of employers, including the, some of the biggest ones in the country, have agreed with the President of the United States not to cut wage rates. And so what happens in late 29 and th throughout practically all of 1930 and in some cases into 31 is that these employers are losing money hand over fist and they're maintaining wage rates. Now in fact, if by maintaining wage rates they were actually in most cases increasing real wage rates because prices of goods were falling and you're a worker, you're still getting the same hourly money wage and yet that money buys more than it did last year. So this is, this is like making things doubly worse. Okay? If at least wages had been cut enough to fall by the same amount prices were falling, <laughs> that would have been better. But by holding up wage rates like that, employers had only one way of effectively adjusting to their condition, and that was to fire people, lay them off. And so if you just work through the simple supply and demand graph you learned in microeconomics, you see that this is a condition of setting a, a wage floor when the demand for labor is falling and the upshot is you have a lot of, of people who are prepared to work who can't work compared to the preceding situation. Okay? You have more unemployment than you would have had. And of course, that's not just one thing because when people are unemployed, they may lose some or all of their income that way, then they can't demand from other sellers and there's a cascading effect. Okay? So this was a terrible, devastating idea that Hoover had and pressed upon people. Finally, they began to bail out of it and things were so bad by 1931. Uh, and, and by the end of 31, practically everybody had given up on this maintenance of wage rates because the economy had really got desperate by that time. Uh, let me remind you that in the years 1931, 32, 33, 34, four years in a row, if you add up the profits of all American corporations, they sum to a negative value. Okay? The whole corporate economy of America was losing money four years straight. Nothing like that had ever happened before. These people desperately needed to adjust, and yet this wage policy that Hoover had imposed uh, had prevented that and caused the depression to develop much quicker than it would have otherwise. In 1930, the government passed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, putting the highest tariff levels on imported goods in American history. Well, that's a good idea, isn't it? When the economy is faltering, increase taxes. Okay? Here's a general rule. Don't do that. Okay? Don't do that. That's always a bad idea. Because taxes are, in one way or another, a disincentive to production, a disincentive to entering into the deals that are being taxed. So here's an important part of the American economy and other economies around the world that is being discouraged. And indeed, after this, this legislation was passed in the middle of 1930, about 60 other countries in the world retaliated by raising their tariffs. So we had a trade war that caused a cumulative downward movement in international specialization and exchange, which is a major way in which the whole world economy makes itself more prosperous. So this Tariff Act was extremely uh, destructive. 
1932, Congress, <clears throat> which had been running deficits, uh, big deficits in 1931-32, and in fact, practically every year of the decade, except for the first one, uh, decided to, to repair its own fiscal condition by raising taxes, all kinds of taxes. Income tax rates were raised enormously in the Tax Act of 1932. The, the top income tax rate, which had been reduced below 30% after being very high during World War I, during the 1920s, it had been gradually reduced. Now in 32, it's shoved up again almost as high as it had been during World War I. And even the lower brackets were raised as well. In addition, the federal government began for the first time to lay a lot of excise taxes on a variety of goods, uh, automobiles, tires, gasoline, bank checks, you, know, you name it. Uh, so the federal government's trying to tax people's uh, private dealings and the sale of pri uh, private goods and services every way it can think of. And what effect does that have on their incentive to produce? Negative. Okay. So we've got this whole series of actions taken under Hoover that make the Depression worse. And as I say, by 1933, it was, it, it was truly in desperate condition. So, of course, Hoover's going to be booted out. Uh, you know, Mickey Mouse could have beaten Hoover in 32, because uh, it didn't matter. Anybody but Hoover was going to win that year. So along comes Franklin Roosevelt, and uh, Roosevelt uh, campaigned in not exactly a Jeffersonian manner, but he was a Democrat, and Democrats had long stood for a certain amount of economic liberty. Uh, going, going all the way back to, to, to Jefferson, up through Grover Cleveland, and, and uh, the Republicans, in contrast, from their birth in the 1850s, had been the party of crony capitalism and subsidies to big business and high tariffs. Uh, and so, so this, this, this was a long-established difference between the parties. And so it made, made people believe when Roosevelt said, yeah, he was going to demand economy and government, that was part of his platform in 1932. Well, that, yeah, that's what a Democrat would do, because Democrats are always complaining that the federal government was too profligate. It was giving away money to veterans, giving away money to, to railroads, giving away money to, to, to various kinds of big capitalists, uh, which was true. But uh, nonetheless, uh, Roosevelt looks like he's sort of a garden variety Democrat, but the, from the moment he became president, he became anything but. He became more interventionist than any Republican had ever been before. And talk about crony capitalism. Crony capitalism really went crazy in 1933. In fact, the centerpiece of the early New Deal, without doubt, was something called the National Industrial Recovery Act. This was a big act enacted in the spring of 1933. And what this act did was just extraordinary. It, it, it demanded that every industry in the country organize itself under something called a code of fair competition. And, well, that sounds good, doesn't it? Who doesn't want fair competition? I know I don't want a phone call right now. I should have <laughs> taken care of that before, but done. But they weren't anything about competition. What these codes were, were devices by which the, the businessmen in the various industries actually conspired to raise taxes and suppress, excuse me, to raise prices and to suppress competition among themselves. And how can you get your prices up, whether you're selling sweet potatoes or, or uh, harvesters and threshers? It, you do that by reducing the market supply. Okay? Whatever the demand is, you can get a higher price if you put less supply on the market. Okay? The demand curve slopes downward, remember? <laughs> if you move the supply point farther up on the demand curve, the price is going to be higher. That's what everybody was going to do under the National Industrial Recovery Act. And that, that indeed is what they did. Because over 700 of these codes are written. <clears throat> 
You might as well write one because the president made it clear oops, that, uh, that if you didn't write one, he would impose one on you. There was something called the blanket code. And that was kind of a, a generic model that, uh, that allowed you to, uh, to undertake various actions to raise wages. Again, here we're back to this wage raising thing. And in fact, the wage raising attempts were part and parcel of the Roosevelt policies as much as they were of the Hoover policies. So in the NIRA, already raising wages was built in there and promoting labor unionization. Again, how do unions get higher wages? Keep competing workers out of the employment. That's how they get the wage up. There's, a, there's only one way to do it. You got to keep non-union members away from offering their services when the wage is raised by the union demand. Okay? So you got this starting in 1933, but think about this. If every, if every industry in America is, is going to get its prices up by reducing supply, add it all up. And what is the whole economy doing? <laughs> it's drastically reducing production. And that's what the depression consists of at bottom, is a reduction in real output. This is like the most senseless thing you could have ever dreamed up. So how, how was it that they enacted such a thing? And the answer is that the businessmen had been conniving this thing for 15 years. And now in the Depression, they have the conditions in which they can, they can shove it through. Let me just tell you a little bit <laughs> from a book by Gene Smiley, an economic historian. Uh, so you don't think I'm the only crazy person uh, around here to hold these beliefs. Th these price and wage commandments bordered on the irrational. He's too kind. They didn't border. <laughs> they were irrational. Okay? Prices and wage rates had fallen significantly in the deflation, see the general reduction of prices, between 1929 and 1933. And few firms had shown profits during the last three years of the contraction. Yet firms were now, under the NIRA, expected to raise wage rates to a level that was at or near wage rates in 1929, while keeping prices at the level of the summer of 1933. And at the same time, they were uh, expected to reduce the work week and spread the work. Okay? This was a big nostrum in the early 30s, work spreading. Okay? If you, can't, you know, if you can't hire enough workers, then just hire a bunch of people part-time. You know, spread the pain around, as if that's going to really help very much. When, it, when what you really want is to get the whole economy producing more, employing more, not just spreading the pain. Okay? So this was, uh, this was the centerpiece of the New Deal, but the New Deal was a, a vast vast collection of nostrums, virtually every one of which caused the depression to be worse than it otherwise would have been. And as I said, I don't have time to waltz through all these now, but uh, my book I referred to, or the, particularly the book Banking and the Business Cycle, will give you a nice recitation of what was done. Now. One of the things that made this such a disaster was this presumption of knowledge, this pretense of understanding that was uh, Hoover's uh, downfall, but was also a product of a whole collection of intellectuals, including many economists who should have known better at the time. Every economic disaster brings, brings economic crackpots out of the woodwork, and causes even good economists to forget what they know. And if you want a recent example, go back to the year 2008 and 2009 and read what economists were saying and recommending in those years. It's a horror story. It's as if they hadn't learned one thing since the publication of Paul Samuelson's textbook in 1948. They were struck dumb. Well, what's happening here? I don't know. How can we deal with it? Well, the government has to spend more. That was pretty much the sum of the whole story. We don't know what's happening, but to get out of it, the government has to spend a lot more money. 
This is like Keynesianism at the most primitive level. I refer to this as vulgar Keynesianism. <laughs> it's the Keynesianism that's espoused by the man in the street and by the politician on the make. Of course, the politician always wants to spend more money because every time the government spends money, it makes the beneficiaries beholden to the benefactors. Re-elect these politicos that dealt out wealth to you so freely. Right? That's the whole name of the game in politics. Make people beholden to you for giving them back a foot after you've cut off their legs. Right? That's the game. And it fools a lot of people. Astonishingly, it fools multitudes of people. So we had these crackpots then, we have crackpots now, and the upshot was that we had this in huge increase in government involvement in the economy, giving rise to what I call participatory fascism. The fascism is because of the vast collusion between firms, corporations, and the state, and the, the participatory part is because we still have elections, you know, we still have due process, we still have all kinds of, of ceremonies that make people believe that their interests are being taken into account, and if their ox is gored, they can complain about it, but that's uh, mostly just a ruse to, uh, to placate people while their, their ox is being gored to the very bone by the people who really exercise government power and influence. Now, from about 1935 on, the Roosevelt administration became desperate because some of these crackpots were threatening Roosevelt's reelection. And Roosevelt concluded by 1935, if not before, that the only way he could ensure his reelection was to be more crackpot than the crackpots. <laughs> so we have then, starting in 1935, what's called by the historians the Second New Deal. The Second New Deal is when this cooperation with business pretty much screeches to a halt or at least moves to a less comprehensive level and instead uh, government begins to attack investors and big businessmen as the, as the ones who are responsible for this tragedy. Uh, Roosevelt talks about economic royalists, you know, the businessmen that are sabotaging his policies. He becomes more and more paranoid every year. And then in 1937, when the recovery was aborted by another sharp contraction before anything like full recovery had been achieved, Roosevelt became really nutso and started blaming everything on his political enemies. Publishers, capitalists, bankers, you know, had to get these guys. And how do you think this made investors feel? not very confident about the future. In fact, there's a lot of evidence of various kinds. Uh, one of my books is called Depression, War, and Cold War. And in there I present uh, evidence from financial markets, from uh, public opinion surveys, and from various historical sources, all of which shows that uh, businessmen became terrified of the government in the late 1930s. They really believed that the economy was heading the same way that Germany and Italy had gone, that dictatorship was on the horizon, that Roosevelt wanted to be a Hitler or a Mussolini, and that their private property rights were on the verge of extinction. And they acted accordingly. So if you're an investor, the way you act accordingly is by not making long-term investments. You know, why throw away good resources today when you're never going to get the return back in the future? And because a private investment uh, never recovered, the economy never recovered. That was a big part of the whole story in the late 1930s, why the economy was of extraordinary duration. And since 2007, it's been an important part of the story here again. Not to the same extent that it was in the 1930s, but to an important extent. We've had regime uncertainty here because of the unprecedented actions taken by the Federal Reserve System and the, the government. Uh, the stimulus bills, Obamacare, Dodd-Frank Act for financial institutions and even 
institutions that never thought of themselves as financial, like pawnbrokers. All these people are subject to this legislation. It was huge legislation, you know, 2,000 page long bill. When you see an act of Congress 2,000 pages long, you know you're looking at fascism in the face. Okay? Because go try to read through it, and what do you see? This is like paragraph after paragraph that's written by, tailored for, and intended to benefit this interest, that interest, this interest, that interest. But it all adds up to what? Economic irrationality. What does it do to the spontaneous order? It makes that order into chaos. What does it do to the expectations of private investors? It discourages them. It makes them think they'd be fools to use perfectly good money today in long-term projects. And as a result, just as in the late 1930s when recovery was delayed, we have now recovery delayed. Still high rates of unemployment or partial employment, uh, huge reductions in the number of people who are even in the labor force, that's been probably the most important effect recently of the recession is that many people just dropped out of the labor force. They don't even pretend to be looking for work anymore. And in fact, the strange thing is that, is that the one group that hasn't dropped out of the labor market as far as its rate of participation is old people. And why are so many more old people participating in the labor market now? Because the Federal Reserve System has, for the last five years, undertaken a zero interest rate policy. So if you're an old person, you saved for your retirement, you were doing the responsible thing, you were taking care of yourself, how can you invest your money now? Any low-risk investment, people used to buy certificates of deposit, they used to put their money in savings accounts at banks, those forms of investment all have negative real yields because the nominal yield is between zero and one percent and inflation is more than that. So huge groups of old people are being wiped out and their only resort is to keep working till they drop. And this same government is constantly voicing how concerned it is about the well-being of the seniors. At the same time, it wipes them out financially, the responsible ones. Of course, the irresponsible ones are in Fat City because the government keeps promising them more and more all the time. So there's a lesson there, folks. Don't be responsible. <laughs> if you want to live happily in the modern world, be a jerk. Be irresponsible and look to the government to bail you out. Thanks a lot.